Okay. Well, thank you very much for the uh, invitation. Sorry about the initial uh, technical problems. Um, so I realised that um, my talk doesn't necessarily fit in that well with uh, the subject of the uh, of the workshop, and I mean I don't have anything to say in the subject of the workshop. Um, so uh, it will have to be something completely different, as has been said before. So what I'll do then for it, I think I have to try and put the these results, which are very sort of technical and of only interest to about three or four people, uh, in a sort of broader context of uh, of, of uh, the subject of random graph. So if you learn anything, maybe you just learn some a little bit about um, an area that you, you you haven't looked at before. So let's go. Okay, so what's so it's about the subject is you choose a graph at random and you look at its properties and you try and say, well, a random graph has this property with very high probability, or a random graph doesn't have this property with very high probability, and you and you just have to find the um the properties and the, the size of the graph, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, with all these parameters. So choosing a graph at random. Uh, so there are basically uh, two, well, there's many ways to choose a random graph, obviously. Uh, two most popular ones are those GNP, where what you do is you take every possible edge from the complete graph and you include it with probability P. And here P could be a function of n, it doesn't have to be a constant. So um, with high probability, it's got about n choose two times P edges. Uh, under the assumption that n choose two times p tends to infinity. And um, if you do it carefully, you can say if p is exactly a half, then you're just taking each subgraph of kn equally likely, or e each n vertex graph equally likely. Uh, another vert another graph, um, similar graph is GNN, where uh, you have the same vertex set, but you uh, fix the number of edges. And it's true that uh, if n is roughly n choose 2 times p, then uh, GNP and GNM have similar properties. So in some sense, if you prove a result in GNP, you can sometimes get the same result for GNM and vice versa. And there are sort of uh, little lemmas which enable you to go from one to the other. Okay, so how, where did random graphs come from? In the sense, how did the subject start? Well, I suppose it does start with Paul Eridos, um, and he used them to prove the existence of, he first used them to prove the existence of graphs with certain properties. So in 1947, he showed that um, in the random graph g and a half, the, um, the maximum size of a clique or an independent set was uh, at most two log n, and from that, which he, was, he wasn't really looking at the Euclid size of a random graph, he, he proves a lower bound on the Ramsey KK. So in other words, he says it's possible to color the edges of a complete graph on two to the K over two vertices so that there is no monochromatic clique of size K. And this bound is essentially, I mean, up to a constant, that's what we know about a lower bound on Ramsey KK. Uh, the, the upper bound has moved a little bit, but the lower bound is, it doesn't seem to move very much. Okay. Uh, the next uh, thing he did was um, it was a study of graphs of large girth and, and large chromatic number. So there was an old result of Mantle, 1907, that you can find triangle free graphs with arbitrary large chromatic number. So what you would think is that if a graph locally looks like a tree, then there should be, and so you, and maybe you can bound the size of the, of the smallest cycle. You know, if, if the smallest cycle is G and G is large, maybe that would put a bound on the size of the chromatic number. And a Mantle's construction is, is a little bit complicated. And Erdos proved that, uh, that, that there is no given, you can take a graph of arbitrary large girth and at the same time get an arbitrary large chromatic number. 
So his proof there was roughly as I say here, you take uh, n to be uh, some constant times n, uh, c is a large constant. Uh, then the thing about this, it has very few, um, it has very few small cycles. So you can remove all the edges and uh, now you've got a graph of large girth, but there are, there, are no, um, there are no very large independent sets. So removing the edges uh, doesn't affect that though very much. So there are no large independent sets. That puts a lower bound on the chromatic number. And now you've got a few, you've got a large chromatic number and you've got a large girth. And this is a very simple proof. And there exist graphs of RV glass girth and chromatic number. It's a very clever proof, right? Okay, then uh, later on, he met up with the probabilist uh, Renier, and they began the study of random graphs in their own right. So the first paper on this was called On Random Graphs 1, 1959. So, n is a half n log n plus some constant times n. What they proved was, uh, that the probability that G and N is connected has a, a very as a sort of change. So when it's it, when it's a little bit smaller than half n log n, then the probability it's connected is almost zero. If it's a little bit bigger than a half n log n, then the probability it's connected tends to one. And you can even say precisely uh, what's the probability that G and N is, or at least the limit of what's the probability that G and M is connected when C N tends to C. And this strange function E to the minus E to the minus C is just the probability that there are no isolated vertices. Okay, it turns out that the expected number of isolated vertices is about E to the minus C, and they're very rare. And so in a limit, that's sort of... Uh, Poisson distribution. So it's a Poisson distribution with mean e to the minus c, so you get this strange e to the minus e to the minus c. But anyway, so they proved this result, and they must have thought, oh, that's a nice result. Uh, so let's let's explore this this uh, these questions uh, a bit more. All right. So then what they did was they uh, started. Um, something, well, they, they study what they call the evolution of a random graph. So what you do here is you start with the empty graph and you keep adding random edges one after the other. And then you can say, after you've added so many edges, um, you can say something with, the, the that with high probability, the structure is of the form of some certain form, right? Okay, so when you throw one edge in, obviously you've got just got one edge, and it's an isolated edge, and everything else is a um, just an isolated vertex. So the first question is, how many edges do you have to add randomly before you um, you get a pair of edges that share a vertex? And this is sort of related to the birthday paradox, and it turns out it's about square root n. So if, you, if the number of edges you add is little o of square root n, then it's the random graph g n m, or g n here, it's just isolated edges and vertices. And if you, um, you push it a little bit beyond little o n to the half, then you'll get isolated edges and vertices of length 2. Okay, so then you say, well, let's keep going. Let's keep adding edges. We've got isolated edges. We've got piles of length two, but nothing else. Isolated edges, piles of length two, isolated vertices. When are you going to see something more complicated? All right? So it turns out that if you want to see, um, let's say, a tree with k vertices, you have to add around about n to the k minus 1k log n I think I missed something here. I put a, a percentage down something. Anyway, round about n to the k minus 1 over k edges, you're going to start seeing trees of size k. Okay. 
Okay. There's something going wrong here, but never mind. I can't really do it much about it at this time. So then the question is, um, what if you allow a linear number of edges? Oh, okay. If you allow a linear number of edges, okay. So let's at the top here, a linear number of edges. So we allow ourselves to have half C N edges where C is less than one. So it's still the same that so when when M was little n, uh, it was still uh, a forest. But when you're now up to constant times n, it's it's and C is less than one, it's mainly trees. There's a few unicyclic components, but the maximum component size is order log n. So the point about C less than one is that the average degree is less than one. So when you look at a vertex and you sort of do a breadth first search, looking at the graph that's growing from it, you find it gets stunted very quickly. It's like a, um, a branching process that must die out because the average growth is less than one. So to see less than one, you've got these unicyclic components, but it's mainly a, it's a forest. And, but, and there's a, a maximum component size of order log n, and we know what the constant is. And probably ought to know what the distribution is. Uh, if C is a half, it's much more complicated. Uh, the maximum component size is about n to the two thirds, and it's it's hard to sort of write down in one slide what's going on. There's a famous paper in 1993 which actually used generating functions to study the growth here. Uh, that's about all I can say about it. Um, but it and then we tell me what C less than one, C is a half. And the question is now when uh, C is bigger than one, now the average degree is bigger than one. So uh, when you're doing breadth first search, there is a chance that something will grow. And indeed, the uh, nice thing now is that there is some unique giant component. So this was the thing that uh, Erdos and Randy really liked this result. At least they stated in their paper that they really liked this result, that there's a unique giant component of size G of C N. And G of C is, is some constant you can, you can write down. And then if you look at the rest of the stuff, it's like uh, a random graph with a slightly smaller uh, P, say. Uh, and the second largest component of size order again, G of C. In fact, G of C is exactly equal to the uh, the probability that some branching process uh, dies out. You see, you have a branching process that has a probability of going off to infinity, and G of C is that probability. So that's about the component size, and that was sort of uh, what uh, Erdos and Narini basically did on uh, component size, but there's still many more questions, so we keep going. And uh, the important point here is that you only need very simple tools. To prove all these results, I would set for the half n, that's much more complicated, but for everything else, you just need basically first moments, you need to just compute the first two moments and say things about the first two moments of the expected number of various things. Okay, so then the question is, um, okay, here's an example of a very simple calculation. Um, connectivity threshold. This is to just to prove that if P is 1 plus epsilon log N over N, then, um, I don't know why I'm doing this, but the expected number, that if P is 1 plus epsilon log N over N, then the graph is connected with higher probability. So XK is the number of, of com so let's say XK is the number of K components um, where one is between K and half N. And so G and P is connected if and only if X is zero. And, and then we just prove that the probability of X is non-zero is less than or equal to, and it's just a straight calculation of the expected number of components of size K. And then a little bit of estimate, very crude estimation, usually tends to zero. 
And then you have to choose, um, yeah, so you know it's connected. Yeah, it is connected. Okay, very simple. Okay. So some of these questions can be uh, refined slightly. So you consider um, what we call the hitting time. So as I said, in this game, what you're doing is you have a sequence of graphs where what you're doing is you're adding uh, an edge. You know, to go from GM to GM plus one, you add a random edge. So you can look at this evolution of this graph. So it starts out empty and gradually the components are getting bigger and bigger and then it becomes connected and so on and so on, right? So we can point to various points in the process where interesting things happen. Okay, so interesting things. What are the interesting things? Okay, so let's say MK is the first time for which the minimum degree is at least K. Okay, so before, you know, uh, if you look at K is 1, uh, before we reach M1, we know that there are isolated vertices. So we know that the graph is not connected. But Erdosh and Rini's proof uh, essentially shows that um, with high probability, as soon as, as soon as you get to M1, minimum degree at least one, the graph becomes connected. You don't have to wait any longer. And this is a sort of, this is a sort of phenomenon that happens um, often and say, because what it says is a very simple and necessary condition, the necessary condition to be connected is that the minimum degree is at least one, that the very simple necessary condition is also sufficient. So it's necessary and almost always sufficient. So are there any other, or what's the next thing you might, well, let's think you say, what other property would you want to consider where you have to have minimum degree one. Well, the next one you can, might consider is uh, having a perfect matching. To have a perfect matching in the graph, you know, a set of n over two um, edges that cover all the vertices, then clearly you have to have minimum degree at least one. Okay, so Erdos and Rennie again, 96. Now this took a bit longer. Uh, it's a more complicated proof. But they say that when you get minimum degree one, not only are you connected, but you have a perfect matching. Of course, if n is not odd, you can't have a perfect matching, but you'll have one of size n over two rounded down. Okay, so you keep going with this game. What happens at n equals two? What might you want to know is uh, when m equals two? Um, well, because we're waiting now for m two, that would be minimum degree two. Uh, so the, the very least you would expect that it's too connected. Uh, but you can say more. When M is uh, M2, not only is it too connected, but it has a Hamilton cycle. And this was a harder result. Because remember, um, Leonardo really started in 1960. And this was, this, this took about 20 years to prove. Um, and I should have mentioned it, but it was gradually, gradually, People were proving you need fewer and fewer edges. Um, and there was this sort of very nice idea of somebody named Posha who, uh, who proved that n log n is enough for order n log n is enough for a Hamilton cycle. And then this was refined by uh, Aitai Komla Semeridi and Bolabash. There's m2. All right, then. So, you, so you've got two um, minimum degree two. So you can keep, you can keep, I can keep going. So you keep going and then what can you say? So you've got one Hamilton cycle. And surprisingly enough, when you get, so what's, what's happening is that this graph is building up. This average degree is about log n and it's just waiting, waiting, waiting for a few vertices to get some edges. So it's a, it's, it's a sort of, you know, it's, it's quite a, a well-structured, random graph with degree average degree log n. So actually you can prove that um, not only is there one Hamilton cycle, but there's an enormous number, log n to the n roughly. 
Uh, so we proved that with Colin Cooper and uh, Glebov and Privilevich sharpened the little o n term. It's still not fixed. We don't know exactly what um, the result is. So the little on term is 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 sort of uh, unknown, and um, there was something nice result. Um, okay, I, I can't remember it, so we'll skip that. Okay, so that's so there are lots of them. You get one, you get you get many, because you're just waiting for just a few vertices. Uh, but also you can uh, say, when do you get edge disjoint Hamilton cycle? So, all right, so if you, uh, if the minimum degree is K, you should get about K over two edge disjoint cycles. So this was a very, this, given what we knew at the time was a fairly easy result, and this was just for K constant, and then um, for K growing is a much more difficult result, and uh, Krivelev, Samoti, and, and people proved that um, uh, fairly recently. So that's Hamilton's cycle to a certain extent, although... Ah, so let's keep going. So I'm trying to build up to... Because um, the, the subject of the talk is supposed to be about some special results on Hamilton's cycles. Um, but I might as well tell you about digraphs. So what do, you, what do we know about random digraphs? Um, so a random digraph is very simple. You take uh, the complete digraph, uh, DNP, the, take the complete digraph, and you allow each oriented edge in the probability P. And for DNN, you just use M, random direct, uh, directed edges. Uh, the structure is, uh, there is something to say about the structure, but we don't ask for components now. We ask for strong components. And then when so the half CNC is less than one, it's very trivial. Um, the interesting result is that when half C M is a half C N and C is bigger than one, you get a unique giant strong component. But the size of the giant component is G of C squared N, where G of C is the size of the giant in GNP. And that comes because what you're doing is you're looking for vertices which have lots of in neighbors. I mean, when I say lots of in neighbors, vertices which could be reached by lots of uh, vertices. And there's about G of C, N of those. And vertices that can reach lots of other vertices is about G of C, N of those. And then you get this G of C squared N, which is really rather cute. And then you get strongly connected at n log n plus omega. And uh, this is related to the coupon collector problem, right? You've got to be, um, you've got to have seen every vertex. Okay, so Hamiltonicity took a bit longer. So there's a very nice result of, of Colin McDiarmid, which says, which proves this result, that if p is bigger than log n, plus log log n plus omega over n, then D and P is Hamiltonian with high probability. Okay, all right then. And I'll give a, I think I can give a vague proof of the McDermott result because it's very clever uh, and there's no, it's, it's very quick bang. Uh, and this is not quite right because that log log n shouldn't be there. And uh, I sort of managed to get rid of the log log n. Uh, but now, this is a McDermott's result. This is how McDermott proved it. And I should have said something. Anyway, so let's suppose E bar to E n is an enumeration of the edges of the complete graph K n. And uh, each E i will have two oriented edges. One, yeah, two oriented edges. Okay. So we consider a sequence of digraphs. Yeah, we improve a sequence of digraphs. Um, in the graph di in the digraph gamma i, we include 
edges E1 up to EI um, independently with probability P, while for J greater than I, we include them both or neither with probability P. So what it means is that gamma zero is GNP and gamma capital N is DNP. So I'm going very gently, gamma I, I'm just moving from GNP to DNP. All right. And the remarkable thing is that you can easily prove that the probability that gamma I is Hamiltonian is at least the probability that gamma I minus one is Hamiltonian. So as you're moving along, you're increasing the chances of being Hamiltonian. So what that says at the end of the day is that the probability that DNP is Hamiltonian is at least the probability that GNP is Hamiltonian. And this explains the log log n. Okay, the log log n comes from minimum degree two. Okay, whereas really in DNP, we want minimum out degree one and minimum in degree one, so we don't need that log log n. And so, and this is a very, it's a, yeah, it's a lovely idea. And there's the proof, basically, those three lines. You sort of say, well, so, well let's condition on everything other than what's going on at EI. Fix everything else. Then either, what do you need? Either you have, either you have um, a Hamilton cycle, no matter what, whether EI exists or not, or you, have a, you don't have a Hamilton cycle, no matter what is the status of EI, or, and then you just check, well, what's the probability that, um, yeah, so that's, there's that, that's that. But then, uh, then you can say, well, there'd be a Hamilton cycle, if and only have at least one of these things. And the chance of having at least one of these things is greater in the directed case than in the undirected case. Okay, so that is a very nice result. Um, and, uh, all right, oh boy. So anyway, I don't know. Well, okay, or maybe I'll just be able to get on to claim some of my our results. Okay, so now what we do is we say to ourselves, okay, we have random graphs, but they're boring. I mean, the edges are all black and white. Let's say, so what happens if we color them? What happens if we color the edges? So let's say they're random colored. So we say a set of edges is rainbow colored if every edge in the set has a different color. And you start asking questions about randomly colored random graphs. Okay, so the first result, I think that maybe the first result in this area, if I, yes, maybe, maybe it was, maybe it wasn't, was you take the graph process and um, your edges come in, E1 up to EM, and as they come in, you give them a random color. And you have enough color. And so, so the question then you says, well, how long is it before you find a spanning tree of the graph in which every color is different. So when it, how is it, how long is it before you get a rainbow spanning tree? Okay, and that turns out to be quite, that's accessible. Okay, so we just say this hitting time are, three hitting times are when you've got enough colors, when you've seen enough colors, that's N minus one, when you've seen enough colors, tau c, when, you, when is it a spanning tree, tau t, and tau rt, when is it a rainbow spanning tree? And it turns out that trt is you just have to wait until there's a tree and you've seen enough colors, and then with high probability, you've got a rainbow tree. And the thing is, the reason this can be done is because um, there's this, this is very, very nice result of Edmonds on matroid intersection. And it, it, this is this is an example of matroid intersection. So an example of not matroid intersection would be Hamilton cycle. You can't do it this way. Same thing, you know, now you want N colors. You want to wait for a Hamilton cycle. 
And the question is, when do you get a rainbow Hamilton cycle? And the conjecture would be as, as given, but we, we don't have that. What we do know, though, is that um, if you have slightly more than n colors, n plus little n, and if you uh, have slightly more than the number of edges that you actually need, 1 plus little o n, then there is a rainbow Hamilton cycle. But it, this is not, uh, a, well, you know, it's, it's not this nice proof using any uh, matrix intersection or anything like that. It's just sort of root, ran, random graph root force sort of thing. So where are we? Oh, we're getting close. We're getting close to the topic of the talk. Okay, so uh, right. Okay, so now let's say uh, let's define G N P alpha. So you got G G N P. So these are so this is a new result. So take G N P, and you color each edge randomly from some. Let's call it the palette one to K. So you've got K random colors, and so we uh, a color pattern would be a sequence C one up to C N. So basically, uh, the question there is. Um, When can I find, so I, 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 have, I have this fixed pattern, I generate a random graph, and I randomly color it. So the question is, uh, can I find a Hamilton cycle? Not only can I find a Hamilton cycle, can I find a Hamilton cycle with this color pattern? You know, can I find a Hamilton cycle that goes red, blue, green, red, blue, green, red, blue, maybe even some non-repeating pattern. And so the claim is that you can do it round about the, um, the threshold. And the proof, oh, there are, pre, there are sort of previous results about repeating patterns, where it goes red, blue, green, red, blue, green, red, blue, green, and that was sorted out much earlier and sort of easier. So this is, we just use um, McDermott's idea. We just use McDermott's idea, so we just have to set it up for McDermott and then argue that it all goes through. So uh, we'll take the, uh, okay, so we just have to say how the first T edges are dealt with and how the, uh, the remaining edges are dealt with. So for I less than T, we give them this random color. And for I greater than T, we don't color it. We just include the edge. And so the beginning is GNP. And at the end, we've got our randomly colored thing. And then we just use this McDermott idea. We just use the McDermott idea. I mean, I'm not going to go through the details, but I'm just going to say that. And it worked, and the paper's on my website. So how long have I got? I've got another five minutes. How long do I speak for? Oh, um, 20 minutes. Pardon? 15 more minutes. 15. 10. 15 more minutes. 15, oh, okay, right, okay, yeah, okay, 15, okay, um, aha. so, okay, so once you're playing this game with coloring, um, you can, instead of coloring the, uh, the edges, you can color the vertices, and so the question then is, um, I fix a pattern, I fix a sequence, and um, I'd like to have a Hamilton cycle which follow this sequence of colors, right? So I have to fix the number of, um, yeah, okay. So I do the following. So I, uh, each color appears alpha j n, uh, so color j appears alpha j n times. And so we can prove that um, with high probability, uh, you get one of these Hamilton cycles. But now we don't prove it bang on the threshold. We can only prove it if you've got sort of big K times the uh, the number of random edges which you actually need. So there, so there is slack here for the proof. Um, I just mentioned that um, the proof results on... So recently in this area, there's been this... Um, 
I'm calling it is a breakthrough result on uh, what they call spread hypergraphs. Um, so, what should I say? Um, yeah. Okay, well, let's just try it. So, a hypergraph is R, R bounded if every edge is at most R. Um, and uh, for every subset of the vertex set, we say that curly bracket S, that sort of angle bracket S, is all this is all the edges that contain that, all the edges that contain that. Um, and then there's this at the bottom. There's this inequality, and this this kappa is called the spread. And if the hypergraph has this property, let's we'll say has spread the property K. And it turns out that many, um, well, and then all you have to do is you have this lower bound of P on, on, on uh, is the lower bound of P. So, I'm, I'm, so the details are not so important. What the important point is, is that for many problems, they can, be, they can be translated into does this hypergraph so no to take this hypergraph which is a sub yeah, take a hyper uh, this is a random hypergraph where edges are included with probability p okay so we're asking a question about random hypergraphs with um edge probability p uh, and then it turns out that you can easily prove that these hypergraphs have a spread of the right value. And once you, once you do that, then you know that there's this, there's this absolute constant C, which gives you the threshold for the existence of an edge. The existence of an edge is translated back to the existence of the edge that you're interested in. So, this, so the hypergraph just consists of all the edges that, that um, correspond to Hamilton cycle. So you say X would be N choose two, X would be all the pairs of edges. There'll be a Hamilton cycle hypergraph, which just consists of, which will be a, which will be N uniform, and will just consist of Hamilton cycles. So what you do is you prove that this hypergraph has spread, and then bang, you get this result that the threshold is order N log N. Just, you don't have to do anything. More interestingly, if you, if you want Hamilton cycles in hypergraphs, which is much harder, you do exactly the same thing. And that, you know, that sort of solved an open problem. That gives you an, a result that sort of took a long time to prove. Same what thing, is, back here, sorry. What is the Hamilton cycle in hypergraph? Uh, well, there are many versions of it, but uh, say a loose Hamilton cycle would be a sequence of edges Okay, which cover all the vertices, uh, where each pair of edges uh, intersects in one. Can you imagine you know, a sort of a ring of edges and they intersect in one? That's called a loose Hamilton cycle. And uh, and then there's a perfect matching in Hamilton. This was thing was uh, Erdos called Shamir's problem, right? And this took oh 20, 30 years to solve by um, Johansson, Kahn, and Vu. Right, but now you can prove Shami, you can solve Shami's problem in half a paragraph using spread. It's uh, yeah, it's very powerful. And so, I mean, you just use spread for that one. Uh, oh God, now what's the next thing? Um, okay, this is the last thing I'll say, and then it is open up for questions. Right. Uh, so suppose, suppose I want a Hamilton, suppose I fix a set of S naught vertices. And I say to myself, I would like a Hamilton cycle in which these vertices appear in a fixed order. Suppose S, yeah. So I've got S naught and this S naught is, uh, say S, S naught is one up to S zero and I want the vertices to appear in this order. And of course, if it's just one vertex, it doesn't matter. If there's two vertices, it doesn't matter. But if you have a lot of vertices, it becomes more complicated. 
And currently we can do it as long as the number of vertices we're trying to do is, uh, it can be a little bit more than n over log n. It can be n times uh, basically log 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 n over n, whereas it really should be n times log log n. But that's just because we couldn't prove it. Um, so I don't really want to go through the proof, but um, maybe I could maybe I could just do this partition thing, right? So you, what do you do is you partition the graph into four subgraphs, and each of those subgraphs has a has a has a uh, a role to play. Uh, then what you do is you then you take S zero and you bury each vertex of S zero inside a little path, and now shrink these paths. And now what you have to do is throw away edge, other edges incident with the internal vertices. And then the complicated bit is you have to find vertex disjoint paths from yv to xv plus 1. So that's a tricky problem, but you can do it. So now you've got edge disjoint paths from yv to xv plus 1. You've, so you've got this, now you've got this long path, you shrink the path down to an edge, and now you find a Hamilton cycle containing that edge, and then that's that's not difficult. You can just use gamma four, gamma three to do that. Okay, uh, I think I'm taking up too much of your time, so uh, I'm not going through this. <laughs>